I'm going to talk about this case discussion on the post-operative Crohn's patient, but as I've been sitting and listening to just one wonderful talk after another from uh, experts, you know, as the surgeon in the audience, you know, to me, the, the message, I think, I think the central message, at least from my perspective, is that caring for the patient with inflammatory bowel disease is a team sport. And we all bring something to the table, and it's not just the gastroenterologists and the surgeons, but, you know, it's the advanced practice nurses. We'd be utterly lost without them. And I think that perhaps there is maybe no better example than that than the postoperative uh, patient with Crohn's disease. And um, I want you to think about this because I'm intentionally presenting the usual typical case, not the zebra, because I want you to think about how this segues with what we've been talking about over the last, and I'd like to sort of dial in some of the other talks because you know, if we think, for us as surgeons, ulcerative colitis can be challenging from the technical standpoint. You know, it's a big operation. How many do you do? What are the technical aspects? But we take the colon out, the patient's cured of ulcerative colitis. Whereas Crohn's disease, I really think as a surgeon, is where we really earn our medal is the ability to manage patients that we're not going to cure, that we're not going to cure as post-ulcerative colitis, and how can we have this seamless transition where surgery fits, right? because most of these, right, the vast majority are going to have operations. How can we do the surgery? How can we use the time of surgery as a time when we can seamlessly transition them back to standard care? So I ask you to think about that, if you would please, uh, when we go through the uh, case. Or my opponent this way? There it goes. Okay. So here's the usual case, right, that I know you see all the time. And I want to think about what we do versus what we ought to be doing. So this is the 35-year-old woman with medically refractory terminal ileal disease. She's undergone an uncomplicated laparoscopic ileocecal resection with primary anastomosis, does fine after surgery. Pathology confirms 20 centimeters of terminal ileal disease with negative margins. And so then the question is, as I say, geez, Ms. Smith, we have all of these wonderful gastroenterologists. Again, this seamless transition. Let's have one of my GI, your gastroenterologists, come see you and uh, decide on prophylaxis. Because again, I don't mean to minimize the treatment options for ulcerative colitis, but right, we don't usually see those patients very far into their disease. You know, right, people know that they're not supposed to have bloody, have bloody diarrhea. You're not supposed to have to rush to the bathroom and put out a quart, you know, blood. They kind of know that's not right, and they usually seek attention quickly. But as you know, a lot of our Crohn's disease patients, they've had numerous different diagnoses, often for many years, before they're uh, diagnosed. So when we talk about recurrence, which I think is the key thing when you're talking about prophylaxis, is it depends what you mean by recurrence. What do you mean? Do you mean that you saw a few plasma cells in the lamina propria and there was a little cryptitis, but the bowel looked completely fine? Is that recurrence? Do you mean that you put the scope in and you see some aphthous ulcerations? Is, is that what you mean when you're talking about recurrence of the asymptomatic? patient, that you see something on a radiologic study, that do you only call it recurrence when the patient's sick again and back on medication, or do you define recurrence um, as the need for another operation? So obviously the risks of those things are going to be night and day different. So I think in terms of, you know, again, and we just heard Eva's wonderful talk is that you know, a lot of these patients have a lot of symptoms that are not necessarily explicable by their intestinal uh, activity. So it's hard to sometimes interpret the symptoms. But, you know, we do have, uh, so we used to focus on clinical uh, recurrence. And I think with a lot of the concepts of Crohn's disease, right, again, with ulcerative colitis, mucosa regenerates. When it's ulcerated, it's going to regenerate. Whereas um, the deeper layers of the bowel wall, the muscle layers heal with collagen deposition. And once it's done, it's done. Once scar tissue is laid down, there's no medicine that's going to fix it. So we've got to use that window of time before they 
they develop fibrostenotic disease to intervene, and I think that's why a lot of us are really focusing more on endoscopic uh, recurrence rather than waiting for symptoms, as we heard eloquently uh, this morning. So again, the vast majority of our patients with Crohn's disease, no matter what the treatment is, uh, will require resection. And I don't mean to in any way minimize the efficacy of medical treatments, but when you look at a lot of the trials of the biologics, right, we're talking about 30% or 40% versus 10% with placebo. So there's big, big groups of patients who don't respond. So when we do the operation, if you want to look at clinical recurrence, you're looking at 17 to 55% at five years, 30, 32 to 76% at 10 years. So it's the rule. It's not the exception. It's the rule. Reoperations, you see the reoperative rates at five and 10 years there. So it's not something that might happen. It's something we certainly have to try and avoid and plan for. Now, with end endoscopic recurrence is most certainly the rule in that virtually all our patients will have evidence of uh, disease activity within a few years, often usually within one, but almost certainly within three years after their operation. It's pretty unusual that someone one or two or three years after the operation has an absolutely pristine uh, colonoscopy. And what we do is that we score it, as you guys know better than I do, um, is that we have this endoscopic scoring system to grade recurrence, and I would argue also to guide therapy. So when we look at the risk factors for recurrence, what should we be doing for prophylaxis? When we look at the risk factors, Again, I know there's a lot more expertise than me uh, in the room, and we could argue about all of these things, but I think these are the ones that I really do think are risk factors, that there's a dose-dependent increase in the risk of recurrence uh, after resection uh, for patients that are smokers. And probably of all the things we can do, arguably the most important and uh, valuable would be to get people to stop smoking. And again, heavy smokers tend to have higher or more prompt recurrence than lighter smokers. Again, when I operate, when we do a long segment of disease, again, this is somebody who's far more likely to end up with recurrence if we've had to take a lot of bowel out. Now, this issue of the positive margin, we're talking about histologic margin, that there have been randomized trials looking at two centimeter margins versus 12 centimeter margins. So the positive margin is a marker of bad disease. It's not something that we as surgeons um, can necessarily impact. So what I mean by that is that if a patient has a microscopically positive margin, they're more likely to end up with recurrent disease. But if surgeons, we keep going further and further and further and further, taking more, the Mayo used to do frozen sections, for example, um, that's not going to be of any benefit to the patient. Disease distribution, again, always important to know the natural history that when um, David asked me to see somebody, when we know he, with Crohn's proctocolitis, and perianal disease, colitis, normal ileum, I know that when we do total proctocolectomy with ileostomy, although we don't say we really cure Crohn's disease, we probably did cure that patient. That in other words, patients with proctocolectomy and ileostomy infrequently recur in the long term if they've had no ileal disease, whereas the usual case of the terminal ileal disease is virtually certain to recur. The perforative phenotype versus the fibrostenotic uh, phenotype in most patients carries a, those in my ballpark odd ratios of about 1.5. Of course, the more operations you've had, the more likely you are to have more operations. Although it's often said that short duration of disease um, is a risk factor, meaning that if you've been diagnosed and you have an operation quickly from the onset of diagnosis as opposed to years down the line, that that's a risk factor. I think that's a hard one, isn't it, to really assess because most patients, when we talk to them, we know that they've had disease a lot, lot longer uh, than from the time that they were diagnosed. I find that one more difficult. Things that some people say are risk factors, but uh, again, we can maybe talk about this on the panel. I don't consider proven 
risk factors is that uh, younger age, male sex, uh, patients with a family history of Crohn's disease. Again, you can find studies supporting all of these things. I just would argue that they're not consistently or unequivocally the case as risk factors. Granulomas, um, we'll talk about uh, anastomosis in just a second. Blood transfusion, as you know, blood transfusions are very, have a potent immunomodulatory effect, but they don't seem to decrease a recurrence after surgery. The anastomosis thing is, is uh, kind of interesting. I'll come back to that at the very end. So what about recurrence? And again, I feel a little sheepish talking about this because there's more expertise amongst you guys probably than me. And again, we could bicker about these numbers, but this, these are my sort of ballpark numbers I walk around with. Um, and that is that uh, 5-ASA is a weak agent. Um, you know, it may have a little bit of efficacy, but probably has no role in this day and age in prophylaxis. The immunomodulator, specifically 6-MP, may be, uh, be associated with a relative risk, maybe of about 0.5. I've pulled these numbers up, right? I'm a surgeon. I'm never right, just always sure. So I make it look like data. Um, in any case, uh, the antibiotics, you know, we certainly, there's good data, especially European data, looking at um, uh, antibiotics. Usually we use right metronidazole, but as you know, you guys treat a lot of patients with metronidazole. That's not tolerated well in the long term. They're going to get a neuropathy, so it's not really a viable uh, long-term option, metronidazole specifically, other antibiotics maybe. And I think what you know, again, I feel sheepish bringing this up here, but certainly, you know, I think the biologics are really, you know, really where we're going to, what we're really talking about. And I think that's where I think the most overwhelming and promising uh, data um, is generated from. Again, no role of steroids for prophylaxis. Probiotics, wouldn't it be great if it worked? You know, I know it's politically correct, but I don't think probiotics prevent a recurrence that there's any data, um, or at least no consistent data for that, and certainly it's not something that I recommend. Um, and I want to talk about, um, David certainly will have more to say about this, because this is largely, um, you know, this is the strategy I believe in, and I think it's the one that we're pretty much using, again, as a relatively newcomer to the University of Chicago, is that why guess? You know, and I think the last thing we want to do, you have a disease where recurrence is the rule. You know that once you have untreated inflammation, like you're going to keep narrowing down, you're going to get the fibrostenotic disease. I don't, no disrespect to some of the earlier, but, you know, biologics are usually not going to cure a fistula. Why wait? Why wait? Nobody would argue that it's easier to treat a fistula or it's easier to treat a fibrostenotic obstruction than to treat mucosal disease. So let's look. Let's, you know, look maybe six months after the operation and detect preclinical recurrence and use, use a data-driven or an endoscopic-driven intervention. Let's find out what works by looking and not wait till people are sick and we can't turn it around. Certainly cl clinical risk factors are pertinent. We, as I said, we know who the people who are at highest risk. So again, I certainly wouldn't tend to advise, um, uh, for example, a biologic or any medicine on someone who's had a proctocolectomy with ileostomy for Crohn's colitis. But I think certainly the patient who's had three operations in the last eight years, no doubt about it. And that's where patient preference comes in and smoking cessation. Um, what I really wanted to uh, close with in terms of some of the interesting things, and before I do, I just want to give one more shout out. Um, you know, we're just so lucky is that on the medical side, Jen uh, Labus and Michelle Rubin on the surgical side, they're the ones at our place that really make this go. And uh, under David's leadership, and with Jen and Michelle, um, all our patients in hospital, when I operate on them, Jen sees them every day. And we make sure when they leave the hospital, I heard that, I love that phrase I heard this morning about the teachable moment. This is the ideal teachable moment. Unfortunately, I think what we often do 
is that we say, oh, thank God, that's the end of it. You know, you're having an operation, just focus on recovering, get well, and you'll be fine and you'll be great. Yes, that's true, but let's not forget about what's coming, you know, down the line. It's, you know, these are often young people, so let's at least think about it then. And let's not use this teachable moment when I've tortured them, you know what I mean? And they have pain medicine and they have incisions in their belly and they have post-operative ileuses and Foley catheters and NG tube. Let's have this moment. Let's not do this again. Let's be doing everything we can not to do this again. So I think the unanswered questions are as follows, at least in my mind's eye. And again, we can, I know there's more expertise certainly than mine. But one of the things we think about is can surgeons impact this post-operative recurrence? You know, one of the things I'm very interested, we're very interested in, as an institution, is the role of the microbiome in recurrence. So that um, you know, one of the issues is can we do the anastomosis differently? Um, you know, for example, side to side, these so-called Kono S anastomoses. But we really, frankly, being that we don't know what causes recurrence, everything is just empiric and largely superstition right now. So I think you know, we participated in a large randomized trial looking at making monster anastomoses, these 10 centimeter anastomoses versus N10. There was no difference in the impact. Of, with respect to recurrence, I think that we need to individualize our care, that we shouldn't do the same thing for everybody. Again, it should be data-driven based on that. Be, we could bicker six month or whatever uh, endoscopy. And I think one of the other questions that we really, at least I don't know the answer is, do you have to be on it for life? So for example, if you started somebody, you know, at what point do you change their agents? Is it forever? You know, what's the cost benefit and uh, ratio uh, of all of that? So anyway, that was meant uh, by means of introduction and perhaps uh, we'll, I know we'll get some wonderful questions and wonderful opinions with uh, all of your expertise with respect to what exactly it is that we ought to be doing so you can think about what you would advise this patient to have. So I uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention.